This screencast will cover repeated measures ANOVA. In this screencast, you will learn how to carry out and interpret a repeated measures ANOVA with one within subject factor. How to carry out and interpret a repeated measures ANOVA with two within subject factors. And how to report the results of a repeated measures ANOVA test. First, we will go over an example of a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. Suppose you were given a data set which had scores of fractional synthesis rate, FSR, of mixed muscle proteins that were taken in 12 participants under three conditions, at rest in the fasted state, following a single bout of resistance exercise in the fasted state and following a single bout of resistance exercise during amino acid feeding. All 12 participants were tested under the three conditions. The aim of the study was to evaluate whether the mean FSR scores differed across conditions. In this example, you have one within subject factor, which is condition, which has three levels, rest, post-exercise, post-exercise during amino acid feeding. You also have a dependent variable, FSR scores, which is measured in each of the three conditions. All main assumptions are the same as a one-way ANOVA, to review these assumptions, please refer to the one-way ANOVA screencast. Additionally, the sphericity assumption must be met. We will go over how to do this in the output. The SPSS file shows each of your conditions, rest, post-exercise, and post-exercise during amino acid feeding. Condition is a name that we gave to the within subject factor in this particular example, but in theory, any label can be used to define the within subject factor. To begin the repeated measures analysis, click Analyze. Click General Linear Model. Click Repeated Measures. This will open up a new window called Repeated Measures Define Factors. In this window, you will define your within subject factor. In this case, your within subject factor is condition. To define condition, select the box that has the word factor 1 in it and replace the word with the word condition. Where it says number of levels, enter the number of levels of your within subject factor. In this instance, we have three levels. So in the box next to number of levels, type in the number three and then click add. Then click define located at the bottom left hand corner of the box. This will now open up the repeated measures window. On the left side box, you can see each of your three within conditions, and on the right, you can see a box called within subject variables. In this box, you want to put each of your three conditions. So you need to select each condition and move it over to the box by clicking the arrow between the two boxes. Once you have moved them over, click Plots. This will open up a window called Repeated Measures Profile Plots. In this window, you will ask SPSS to create a plot. The plot that SPSS will create will show the means of each condition separately. Click Condition and then click the arrow between the Factors box and the Horizontal Access box. This will move condition across to the horizontal access box. Then click Add. Click Continue. Click Options. 
This will open up a new window called Repeated Measures Options. Select Conditions and then click the blue arrow located between the Factors and Factor Interactions box and the Displays Means 4 box. This will move Condition over to the Display Means 4 box. Click Compare Main Effects and select for confidence interval adjustment the Bonferroni method. This will produce a pairwise comparison table in which each condition will be compared against the other two. Under the display box, click Descriptives, Estimates of Effect Size, and Observed Power. If you are testing the assumptions of ANOVA, you should also tick the boxes for homogeneity tests and spread verse level plot. For more information, see the screencast on One Way ANOVA. Click Continue. Click OK. This will now open up your output file. The current box, outlined in yellow, displays the descriptive statistics for each of the conditions. You can see the means, standard deviations, and number of participants in each condition. The current box, outlined in yellow, displays Mulchley's test of sphericity. The assumption of Mulchley's test is met when it is not significant. However, with moderate to large sample sizes, this test will be significant even with minor violations of the assumption. In our results, the Mochley's test is significant, which means the assumption is not met in our data. Since the Mochley's test is significant and an assumption is not met, we may want to consider using an epsilon correction or a multivariate approach to repeated measures. In this screencast, we will cover how to use an epsilon correction. We will now scroll down to the part of the output that says tests of within subject effects. The conditions box answers the question of whether the mean FSR scores differ across the conditions. Because the Mochley's test was significant, we cannot use the line that says sphericity assumed. We will read from the line that says greenhouse geyser, which I have now highlighted in yellow. We know our results are significant because our significance value, or our p-value, is less than 0 0.05. Our significant results indicate that the mean FSR scores differ significantly across the conditions. The degrees of freedom for reporting a one-way repeated measures ANOVA also come from the test of within subjects effects box. If we focus our attention on the line, which is highlighted in yellow, we can look at the column DF, which stands for degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for this are 1.356, so when writing it up, our first number in the degrees of freedom bracket is 1.356. The second number in the degrees of freedom brackets comes from the error line, which is the box below condition. Because we've used the greenhouse geyser correction above, we must use it now. So if we look at the degrees of freedom column and go down to the error box in the greenhouse geyser line, we see that our second number in the degrees of freedom bracket will be 14.919. It is important to note that the greenhouse geyser correction is one option and the other two options are also possible when the assumption of sphericity has been violated. However, the greenhouse geyser is the most commonly used epsilon correction. Scroll down to the area that says estimated marginal means. If we look at the current box outlined in yellow under the word condition that says estimates, we can see that the table for condition presents the mean FSR scores for each condition. It seems that the mean FSR is highest in the post-exercise amino acid condition and the lowest in the rest condition. However, which conditions differ significantly from the rest? 
To answer this question, we need to look at the table below entitled Pairwise Comparisons. The Pairwise Comparisons table, outlined in yellow, shows us that all three conditions differ significantly from one another. In all cases, the significance value, or the p-value, is less than 0 .001. The plot at the bottom of the SPSS output provides a visual representation of our data. Condition is located on the x-axis, and the mean FSR score is located on the y-axis. Here we can see that in the third condition, the post-exercise amino acid condition, participants had the highest FSR score. When reporting the results of the one-way ANOVA, you should report the results of the within-subject factor. In this case, the within-subject factor is FSR score, and it was measured in three different conditions. Our results were significant, and this is displayed in the significance value of P less than 0 .001. You also need to report which conditions were different from each other. As we saw in the pairwise comparisons, each of the three conditions were different from one another. We are now going to add a second within subject factor, training, with two levels, pre and post. The purpose is to examine the FSR score measured in the same participants during the three conditions prior, which is pre, and following, which is post, 16 weeks of resistance exercise training. In this example, the condition factor is nested within the training factor. The hypotheses are as follows. The first within subject factor, training, the mean FSR score will be higher after compared to before training, meaning the mean FSR score will be higher post compared to pre. We will now go through an example of a two-way repeated measures ANOVA. The second within subject factor, condition, the mean FSR score will be higher in the post-exercise amino acid condition compared to the other two conditions. The third hypothesis involves the interaction between training and condition. The differences among the three conditions will be smaller after exercise than before, so the differences between the rest, post-exercise, and post-exercise amino acid conditions will be smaller post-training rather than pre. Our data set now contains more variables. It has the rest, post-exercise, and post-exercise amino acid in the pre-intervention training conditions and it has the rest, post-exercise, and post-exercise amino acid in the post-training intervention conditions. It is important to note that condition is the name that you give to the within subject factor in the example, but in theory any label can be used to define the within subject factor. To begin the analysis, click Analyze. Click General Linear Models. Click Repeated Measures. This will open up a new window called Repeated Measures Define Factors. In this window, we will define our two within subject factors. To define the first within subject factor condition, highlight where it says Factor 1 and replace it with the word Condition. Where it says Number of Levels, enter 3 and then click Add. Now click on the same box where you entered condition and replace it with the word training and where it says number of levels, put two to represent the two training levels we have, pre-exercise intervention and post-exercise intervention and then click add. Then click define. This will open up a new window called repeated measures. Your variables are located on the left side. The order in which you move the variables to the within subject variables box is very important. The data file lists the th three conditions at pre-training, followed by the three conditions at post-training. However, notice the notation within the within subjects variable box. 
I have outlined the notation in red so you can see it. The notation says bracket condition comma training bracket. That means the area that says bracket one comma one bracket stands for the first level of condition and the first level of training, which is rest underscore pre. Bracket one comma two bracket stands for the first level of condition and the second level of training. That is rest underscore post. If you move across the variables in the order they appear in the data file, you will have incorrectly enter post x underscore pre is the second variable instead of rest underscore post. In the same way, you will also make other similar mistakes when moving across the other variables in the data file. SPSS cannot tell what is right or wrong in order of variables. You have to make sure that you transfer the variables in the right order, otherwise your results will become meaningless. The right order is as follows. First transfer the pre and post scores for the first condition, rest then the pre and post scores for the second condition, post x, and finally the pre and post scores for the third condition, post x aa. To do this, click on the value you want to move across and then click on the arrow between the two boxes. Remember, you must move them across in the correct order. Once you have moved all the variables across in the correct order, click on Plots. This will open up a new window called Repeated Measures Profile Plots. Move Training to the Horizontal Access box and Condition to the Separate Lines box. We normally move to the Separate Lines box the variable with the fewer levels so that we do not create too many lines in the plot. In this example, the variable with the fewer levels is condition. Then click Add. If the interaction between the two within subject factors is significant, it will be informative to inspect the interaction plot which will be created by this option. Click Continue. Click Options. This will open up a new window called Repeated Measures Options. In the Estimated Marginal Means box, select Condition and Condition Asterisk Training and move them across to the Displays Means For box. Tick Compare Main Effects and change the Confidence Interval Adjustment to the Bonferroni method. This will produce a pairwise comparison table in which each condition will be compared with the other two. As training has two levels, we don't need to perform such comparisons for this variable. This is because when a variable with a significant f value has two levels, we know that one level is higher than the other. Under the display box, click Descriptive Statistics, Estimates of Effect Size, and Observed Power, then click Continue. If you are testing the assumptions of ANOVA, you should also tick the box for homogeneity tests and spread versus level plot. 
For more information, see the screencast on One Way ANOVA. Click OK. This will open up the output window. In the output window, the current box, outlined in yellow, displays the descriptive statistics. This gives the means and standard deviations as well as the number of participants for each of the conditions. Now let's look at the Mochley's test of sphericity, outlined in yellow. Separate values for this test are provided for each within subject factor and their interaction. However, note that because the within subject factor training has two levels, there is no value for the Mochley's test. This is not surprising because the test compares the variances of the different scores between the levels of the factor. If the factor has two levels, there is only one different score. So a comparison of variances cannot be made because there is no other different score. Therefore, the Mochley's test requires at least three levels for within subject factors so that the variances of multiple different scores can be compared. Looking at the significance values that I have now highlighted in yellow, we can see that the value for condition is significant. This means that the assumption of sphericity is not met. For the interaction, the test is non-significant, indicating that the assumption is met. Move down now to the tests of within subject effects box, which is outlined in yellow on this screen. We will look at the condition, training, and the condition training interaction boxes. These boxes will answer our hypotheses which we discussed at the beginning of the section. Focus on the condition box which I have highlighted in yellow. In this box we will use the greenhouse geyser row because the sphericity assumption is not met with this variable. We can see that there is a significant effect or a significant p-value for this condition because p is less than 0 0.001. Now look at the training box, which I have highlighted in yellow. Because training only has two levels, there is no Mochley's test of sphericity for this variable. Thus, there are no epsilon corrections for the degrees of freedom. That is why all rows are identical. We can see here that the f value is significant and that there are differences in FSR between pre and post training. Now look at the condition asterisk training or the condition training interaction box which I have highlighted in yellow. Note here that different rows in this box will lead to different conclusions. The Mochley's test of sphericity indicated that the assumption was met. Had this assumption not been met, we would have had to use an epsilon correction. Some of the epsilon corrections are more conservative than others. For example, if we had used the conservative greenhouse geyser or the lower bound correction, we would have concluded that the condition training interaction was not significant. In contrast, the Heinfeldt correction is more liberal and indicates that the interaction is significant. For more information on the strengths and weaknesses, of each epsilon correction consult statistics books. Since sphericity is assumed, we can look at that significance value in that row. We can see that the significance value, or the p-value, is equal to 0 0.040, meaning that it is less than 0 0.05 and is therefore a significant interaction. When an interaction is statistically significant, you do not further interpret the main effects. However, for the sake of the screencast, we will go through how to interpret each of the main effects. Move down to the pairwise comparison box that compares the conditions. It is outlined in yellow on the screen. This box tells us that all means are significantly different from each other, which means that each of the conditions were significantly different from one another. The means for training are significantly different from one another. We know that because there are only two means and there was a significant difference indicated in the within subjects box. The plot at the end of the output shows the mean FSR levels separately for each condition, before and after training. 
it seems in accordance with the interaction hypothesis that the differences in FSR among the three conditions are smaller after exercise than before exercise. However, we can look further at the interaction by changing the command for repeated measures to obtain a pairwise comparisons for the interaction term. To begin, click Analyze. Click General Linear Model. Click Repeated Measures. This will open up the Repeated Measures Define Factors box. As you can see, your factors of condition and training are already added, so click Define. This will open up your Repeated Measures box. Click Paste. The command for your output is now pasted on the screen. Put the cursor at the end of the line that says backslash em means equals tables bracket condition asterisk training bracket. Where you have placed the cursor, enter the text that I have outlined in yellow on the screen in the exact same location. This subcommand will compare separately for pre and post training the three conditions. Click enter and then enter the text that is currently highlighted in yellow on the screen in the new blank line you have created below. This subcommand will compare separately for each condition the means for pre and post training. Highlight all of the text and select the green triangle button at the top to run the syntax. If you wanted to do this with your own data, you simply need to substitute the labels condition and training with the labels of the within subject factors in your data set. You shouldn't change anything else. This opens up the output window. The current table, outlined in yellow, shows the training groups separately for in each box and shows the conditions for each of those training groups. We can tell by looking at this that each of the conditions differed from one another statistically significant in each of the training groups. That is, the difference between condition 1 and 2 was statistically different from one another in both training 1 before exercise intervention and training 2 after exercise intervention. The current box, outlined in yellow, compares separately for each condition the means for pre- and post-training. The box, outlined in blue and highlighted in yellow, answers the question of is the change in FSR scores of the post-exercise amino acid-fed group from pre- to post-training significantly different? And the answer is no. There is no significant difference, as you can see here, because P is equal to 0 0.309, which is higher than P less than 0 0.05. Using SPSS contrasts, one can test more complex contrasts for within subject factor. For example, compare the mean of the rest of the condition against the average mean of the other two conditions or for the interaction between two within subject factors. Examine whether the mean difference between the rest and post-exercise amino acid conditions at pre-training is significantly different from the mean difference between the same conditions at post-training. To do this, you need to click Analyze. Click General Linear Models. Click Repeated Measures. Since the factors are already defined, just click Define. Click Contrast, located at the far right of the box Repeated Measures. There are numerous options available in the Contrast window, as you can see in the drop-down menu. Consult advanced statistics books for setting up such contrasts. When presenting the results of a repeated measures ANOVA, you present separately for each within subject factor and its interaction. You present the F values, its degrees of freedom, and the probability value. 
Each f value has two degrees of freedom, one from the independent variable and one from the error term corresponding to that independent variable. The values for the degrees of freedom were taken from the tests of within subjects effect output table. The degrees of freedom for the first f value have decimal points because the greenhouse geyser correction degrees of freedom were used for the first variable. You can also present the results in figure or table format. Figure format is easier for the reader to understand, especially when the interaction is significant. Table format, which is presented here, shows the means and standard deviations. This concludes the screencast on repeated measures ANOVA. In this screencast, we learned how to carry out and interpret a repeated measures ANOVA with one within subject factor. How to carry out and interpret a repeated measures ANOVA with two within subject factors and how to report the results of a repeated measures ANOVA test.